Hey y'all, welcome. Welcome back to Interstage Window, my Saturday stream, which is a conversation with my friends. And today I have with me Landon. Say hi, Landon. Oh my gosh, what are we talking about today, Landon? We're gonna enter the Little Mermaid Extended Universe. AKA, oh we're God. talking about the 1990s TV show. We're talking about the sequel. We're talking about the prequel. Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna, let's be clear. Let's like, no spoilers. We're gonna, or actually all the spoilers. We're gonna hate on the prequel. That's what we're gonna do for a lot of the stream. Okay, yes, that is true. Okay, so there are, so let me show you all the PowerPoint. Okay, so just to kind of like let everybody know what's up. There are basically three pieces of, con of content in what we are calling this Little Mermaid Extended Universe. Okay, there was the cartoon that came out a few years after the movie, the 90s cartoon, if you know, you know. Um, there is the sequel that um, that Landon knows very well that we're going to talk about. And then there's the third movie, which is a prequel that kind of retcons the cartoon. And we have thoughts on it. So those are the three pieces we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about them in the chronological order that they um, that they existed, right? Like in the order yes. that they came out. Yes, and and the impacts, and just like why Disney made them, and all that fun stuff too. So it's it's a fun and flirty episode of the Little Mermaid Extended Universe. <laughs> yes, yes. So we're not talking about like the musical Broadway version. There's also no. like the television musical version. We talked about the live action remake last time. So mm -hmm. like just so that it's clear, the things we're covering and not covering. Yeah. No, this is the Disney produced uh, anything that is prequel or. Or sequel mm -hmm. and it's all basically. cartoon it's all cartoon. yes all cartoon yes um all right let's get into it then no okay. not too much preamble i feel like we need to do let's talk about this 1990s uh, little mermaid tv show yes okay so the 1992 little mermaid tv show there was three seasons of it the first season um was kind of long but the next two seasons were only like nine and eight episodes respectively so essentially what happens in this tv show in case you didn't watch it is that we have a prequel from before the events of the little mermaid movie because everyone just wants to see ariel as a mermaid nobody wants human ariel all the little girls want a mermaid ariel so they make a cartoon about mermaid ariel that basically gives the backstory several different events happen in this tv show they do show like a flashback of where Ariel and Flounder met as children. They show Ariel having much um, more complex and deeper relationships with all of her sisters. So you actually get to know a little piece, little bit about each of the sisters. Um, Ariel also makes various other mermaid friends, notable ones being um, Urchin, who is like this uh, this mer boy <laughs> that you know, but he's young, but he's a guy. Um, also pictured here, who I can't remember her name, but she's a she's a a deaf mermaid yeah deaf mermaid that we meet um in here there's also new villains in this show uh, the ineffable best part of the show uh evil manta <laughs> Gotta and, love e Evil Manta. Oh my god. And his son, who is uh, called Little Evil. Um, Hey, Arya. Yes, because it was actually really good. So that should give you enough information to know kind of the context of what we are talking about in regards to this TV show. Yeah. And, and I think it's like an interesting... An interesting thing that happened. So I I will be honest, I was not born yet when this TV show came out. So it <laughs> passed me over completely. I uh, I did not watch this as a child, but Karen did. Mm -hmm. uh, and was the person that informed me that this thing existed. And I had seen images of Manta Ray because he is pretty big in the, in the Little Mermaid lore. But I hadn't really known any of this. Yes. Um, but I think that there is some like really cool history here as far as uh, like what this stood for. So the Little Mermaid TV show was the first TV show to follow a Disney animated movie. Um, since then, there had been other ones, but the the movie came back out in 1989 and very quickly after knowing that it was fully animated uh the popularity had caused them to then start producing this tv show mm -hmm. and what is also really cool about it is that basically the entirety of the original cast voice actors uh stayed on for this project the only person 
not having done that is flounder because at that point flounder had gone through puberty and did not sound anything like he was <laughs> in the tv in the movie yeah uh, so they they did hire a new flounder and honestly the same thing that happened to original flounder starts happening to this flounder and by season three flounder doesn't sound like flounder anymore um but luckily the show ended but they refused in season three to recast him for yeah. a third time which i think was really cool and uh, and good and pro worker of disney so i really like that um, Arya says, I saw reruns and VHS versions, so might have missed a few episodes. Well, Arya, I have fantastic news for you. Every all single episode best. is on Disney+. Plus. So if you do want to have a little nostalgia trip, it's all there. It is all there. I also think, like, talking about a how, in, like, the fact that there was deaf representation and also, you know, mermaids of color representation a little in bit. In 1992. In 1992. Yeah. yeah impressive for yeah. that I, I also think like there was an interesting concept of this age in the midst of the renaissance that instead of automatically going to a sequel they decided to go to tv mm -hmm. um whether that's because they could pa faster produce it as uh the animated movies that disney produced t takes anywhere between at that point five and ten years to produce and create uh they were able to get product out faster mm -hmm. or if it was just like that that is what the industry said that we wanted was more content on, available on television for us to watch it is fascinating because after the success of this of this show aladdin uh, which is a movie that came out later, then obviously uh, got its own TV show, The Adventures of Aladdin. Timon and Pumbaa uh, mm -hmm. with The Lion King got their own TV show. And then even as late as uh, the 2001, The Legends of Tarzan uh, got its own TV show as well, which is a TV show that I, I did used to watch that one. Yeah, uh, I was too old so, for that one. I missed that one. Um, But it, it just a very interesting, like... Like that was the theme of the 90s was instead of making sequels, they really heavily focused on producing television shows prior to Disney Channel existing. Because at this point, Disney Channel didn't have its own show or its own channel on cable network to host all these. They were being hosted on like CBS and ABC. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And now eventually Disney, like during the, the time of this show, by the end of it, a Disney Channel did exist and it was airing on the Disney Channel. And of course, lots of reruns of this show aired on the Disney Channel. But during this time, Disney really did have a push to um, improve and innovate what their TV offerings were, which eventually did launch into the Disney Channel. So we can thank the Little Mermaid TV show for a couple of things, one being part of that launching of the, the Disney Channel, and also being the precursor that proved that these types of TV shows could be successful. And that's why we got the ones like Aladdin, Timon and Pumbaa, and all of those that Landon mentioned as well as, you know, many yeah. others. Yeah. I also think, I think it also proved like that we were hungry as a generation for sequels mm -hmm. that we wanted, that we loved these princesses so much that we wanted sequels. I'm trying to think, I, I haven't done any research on this, but I'm just trying to think of the concept of when like sequels became a part of media like a popular form of media of of because i'm trying to think of like sequels that happened as far as movies go yeah prior, I, and i'm thinking like star wars i'm thinking but like those are more series than sequels yeah and i think that sequels have always been popular in certain genres like horror has always had a lot of sequels yes. science fiction fantasy has always um had a lot of sequels um but uh but cartoons not so much not yeah. so much the sequels sequels for cartoons were not a thing for the longest time oh yeah i remember the lilo and stitch one too i do remember actually being too old for that but catching a few episodes oh, of it because the, i love lilo and stitch the so TV much show? Yes. yeah the they had the, also TV the show. pink stitch um, but i can't remember her name but yeah it had however, a pink stitch <laughs> that actually follows a different algorithm than the mm -hmm. other ones that i had mentioned uh because that came after the sequel movie yes um there is a shift when so this is obviously like in the 90s, they weren't making sequels to the major animated movies. Uh, and I, what I was kind of starting to go with that conversation was like, I think that that Little Mermaid, the TV show showed that there was space for something like that to exist in the animation. Uh, so somewhere in that 2000, late 90s, 2000, early 2000 switch, there became 
uh, instead of it going from like, oh, uh, original content TV show sequel, it became original con- mm-hmm. content sequel TV show yes. uh, as popularity trended down because then they knew that they had something that they they had their own channel to host. They could create their own uh, content mm-hmm. that they didn't necessarily have to invest as much money as as when they originally did it uh, in the 90s. Yes. So very, that's very that's true. a that's an interesting switch as well. Yep. The other thing that's really cool about the Little Mermaid TV show, which wasn't always true of like these 80s and early 90s cartoons, is that the animation was actually not that bad compared to a real feature length film. So no. anybody that was growing up in the 80s or early 90s, and so you saw a lot of these 80s cartoon reruns. The animation was terrible. It was so bad. <laughs> it was there just to sell you toys. And not to say that this show wasn't there just to sell you toys, because it was. However, the animation, although it was not as good a quality as the movie, and the quality did degrade, like, if you watch a season three episode, the quality of the animation is nothing compared to the season one episodes. But you can um, you can tell the yeah, you can even tell the in, the, in, in the yeah, in the, in the screenshots. <laughs> yeah. And and so it's like you know, but at the same time, like, it was this, like, major step above other, like, Saturday morning cartoon type of fare. So as a kid, like, that is very enthralling. Like, oh, Ariel looks like Ariel. Wow. Well, I think, like, on that track, too, I wonder if this is the beginnings in some way of the, like, master list of it, it it is very famously known that disney has uh a very very specific animation like bible of mm. the requirements of their princesses yes uh in the branding of anything that is created marketed anything like that there are there are uh traits and certain like skew colors and uh items of clothing and and lines and and voice accents that that are all in this bible and I wonder if this is the start of that Bible, knowing that because they had to get the buy-in of animated fans from the movie, they had to make it recognizable enough mm-hmm. for kids to understand that this is the same person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and that there had to be like being able to then boil down what can we keep of Ariel you know as a drawing for her to still be aerial Mm -hmm. uh and Mm -hmm. and that being the start of it's like the disney bible yeah i don't know but i i could definitely see it contributing um are you saying i didn't care as much about the animation quality but as an adult it's pretty obvious yeah so i don't think a kid's thinking about it like oh the animation quality is so good they're just thinking like wow ariel looks like ariel instead of like you notice you notice when your favorite cartoon character's hair color is wrong or something you know what i mean yeah and I mean, we're also talking about kids who yeah. famously watch the movie over and over and over again. Yeah. And I don't know if anyone has ever interacted with kids. There is an amazing moment when you then show them something new with the same characters. It's a magical moment of them being like, new adventures. Yeah. And that was like the buy-in uh, mm-hmm. of like the thing that the story that you watched a hundred times kids not having the the space or the understanding that new stuff was coming out to all of a sudden then see new stuff yeah and get that excitement and that buy-in there uh and they had to like connect it enough the animation style had to match enough that though that 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 process could happen yep the in the there's like some other cool stuff not just the animation quality that i think like as an adult why i was able to re-watch every episode and it not be painful to me now if you didn't see it originally as a kid i don't recommend re-watching all the episodes because it is for kids and it's not going to be very entertaining to you however if you did see it as a kid the nostalgia is still there and it's not just the animation the other big factor that made it still watchable to me as an adult um is all the songs because those songs when i hear yeah them it taps into my memories of those songs as a kid and it's kind of like oh my gosh I remember this song you know and and because like I was watching these as like Saturday morning cartoons as a kid you almost wonder like did I make that up or where did I hear that from I know this song in my head but I have no idea what it's from and then you hear it again and you're like oh and the other thing that I can report to you guys is most of these songs are really good actually 
sonically they they shared themes and mm-hmm. I'm I'm not sure that they shared writers but they certainly shared themes and instruments and the reasons why and the the way that characters sang because it was also all the same actors yeah like that helps good. too uh so it is the songs as someone who obviously had the opposite of, of Karen right didn't have the nostalgia and then tried to watch a couple of episodes that just did not work I'll be completely it's okay it's honest. okay y'all I told Landon which didn't episode she had to watch so don't worry <laughs> yeah. she watched the evil manta episodes she watched the episode that with the end is like oh it's Hans Christian Anderson by the way you know so that she watched fun. she watched the needed one so don't worry <laughs> I did I did watch some but certainly could not sit through the th- three seasons unlike Karen who enjoyed it there were moments of like recognition even though i had never watched it because of that sonic sound because Mm -hmm. of the actor sound like they really did like this is i am just thinking back to us talking last time about the difference between um like having to accept that these remakes are no longer for us and that they're for mm. the kids and don't it's accept like, it man, i still don't but i hear you but anyway but i understand <laughs> i mean i kind of understand in some aspects why it's harder for you to accept it if you had this relationship with it knowing mm-hmm. that it could be extended and be so fate and be so faithful yet different yeah um because disney has done that whereas i don't have that experience so i'm just like yeah of course they freaking remade it and it lost its soul that's what happens and you're like no you can extend like companies and artists can do it can extend it and it's keep itself and this this did that that yeah and i think and i think like you just said something that i just want to touch on like the soul like when you watch this it has the same soul as the original movie it's just a TV version of it, but it is the same bones. It's the same soul. It's all of that. It's the same. It is. Um, yeah, there's certainly that. And it, and it, who knows if it's the cast, if it's the writing, if it's the team, if it's all of it uh, and the love for the project or, or even like the risk that they didn't have to take a huge financial risk at this because all they were doing was producing a TV show. And if it mm-hmm. failed, then TV shows fail all the time. Mm-hmm. Um and and because of that, you could stick truer to art rather than to what needs to be consumed. Yeah, maybe. but it was it was really it's really fun. It's really good. Yeah, and now as a kid, you are quite focused on like Ariel and her being this like carefree, fun mermaid. But there was a couple of takeaways that I had rewatching it as an adult that gave me a new perspective that I thought were very interesting. Um, when I think about this show holistically. And I did like sit down and I watched every episode, you know, one after the other in order. And I think about the different plot lines we have in these episodes. The majority of the plot lines are actually about Sebastian. And a lot of them are about his career angst, funny enough. Um, So as an adult, the plot lines had like this extra level of entertainment, most of them, Um, because there are still plot lines that are around Ariel and Flounder and stuff. And of course, like they're very childish. But the Sebastian plot lines, I was able to get like something else out of them that I couldn't get out of it. Um, as a kid that just made me love the character even more and be even more sad at what they did to him in the live action remake, making him look like a real crab so that he can't bounce around and be crazy and screaming all the time. Because in this cartoon, he is delightful. He is clearly the character that's there for the parents and he does a great job at it while still being fun to watch for the kids because he's bouncing around all the time. I think it's also interesting that he is like the only through line yeah. Not, like like plot wise uh you there is a through line plot for him uh other than that every episode is episodic where you know the there is a there is a problem problem gets solved happily ever after in every single episode mm-hmm. except for the times that sebastian just wants to climb the corporate ladder <laughs> and then it's just like oh that's that is like the thing that connects everything and it's very interesting that that exists Mm -hmm. like Um, there's one episode in particular that i think is in season two like i want to say it's like in the middle or in the beginning of season three where sebastian has this um this like wish right poor sebastian stress and overwork yes exactly and that's what this episode touches on so here's basically the plot of the episode um the gang finds this uh this map to this place where they can go get their wishes granted so they find this cave that grants wishes and sebastian wants so badly 
to be big. He's tired of his small stature because it means that he has to work extra hard to keep up with everyone else. Who can relate? Who can't relate? Okay. Only short he, girls. Uh, only short girls. <laughs> uh, so I I just, I'm like, oh, Sebastian, I understand. And you can take this literally, liter- it's literal in the episode, but it could be metaphorical. So anyway, Ariel gets this magic so that she can grant witches and she uses this magic to make Sebastian big. She's like, let's have big Sebastian. So he's the same size as the rest of us. Well, of course, the magic goes horribly wrong. And Sebastian grows and grows and grows and grows and grows until he's so big that he's crushing buildings in Atlantica. And uh, and so he realizes that actually working a little extra hard to overcome what is natural about me and staying true to myself is good. Actually, I want to be small again. They go on an adventure. They restore him. Everything's fine in the end, of course, because it's a 20-minute cartoon. But But like that resonated with me so much that feeling of like, I deserve more and I deserve better and I shouldn't have to work so hard. Um, Like that is so like adult relatable, which as a kid, of course, it's like, whoosh. Like as a kid, it's just like, oh, haha, Sebastian's so big now. He's crushing buildings. That sucks for him, you know. But as an adult, you get this whole other level of it. And a lot of the Sebastian episodes are like that. That's just one example. It's... It's very fun. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I do, I do love that. I do love Mm -hmm. that little takeaway. And I think, Um, I think, and there's another one too. It's not just Sebastian, right? Like Triton's quite different in this this show. He Mm -hmm. has to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mm -hmm. we talked about how in like truly Triton had to be an antagonist and is probably one of the main antagonists while Ursula was the villain. Triton had to be the antagonist, the, Mm -hmm. the, the thing that was competing against the problem in Little Mermaid. And he was scary for it. He was angry. He yelled. He destroyed all of all of Ariel's stuff. He frightened kids and had to because we had to then empathize with Ariel's want to run away and do something completely different. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't have that as a happy through line of a tv show that's supposed to showcase a relatively happy young woman uh so so we had to we had to humanize triton Mm -hmm. in in ways that were very interesting and also show the buildup of why he gets so angry in the little mermaid yeah, because um, it's not just it's not just what happens in the events of the movie. If you take this TV show as canon as well, Ariel has been for years pushing boundaries, and not just in regards to her human obsession in the movie. Like she does have the human obsession in the TV show, but she pushes boundaries in all kinds of ways in the TV show. Like she is just not a rule follower. She does not care about her own safety. She doesn't care about the safety of Sebastian and Flounder and all of those around her. She just doesn't, and is constantly getting in trouble for this. And you can tell by the movie that Triton would just be at his wits end yes but i also think uh, there's a couple of things there though that uh will tie back into when we talk about the prequel because Uh spoiler alert (laughs) it doesn't uh, it doesn't add up it doesn't match up uh there is never a time at least in the episodes that i watched uh, in which you and and the synopsis is that i read in which you question that he loves his daughter true You just see a parent who is overly worried and tired Mm -hmm. uh, watching as his daughter risks her life again and again in ways that he doesn't understand and doesn't know what to do with her in Mm -hmm. some aspects. Mm -hmm. A very relatable dynamic that I think a lot of kids could connect to. Yeah. Uh, But he is so humanized and so like treated in a not kindly because he's still triton he still he still has that triton-esque sort of thing to him yeah Uh, he's still very stern he's still very stern yeah but he he he's understandable Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh and everything adds up to make the character's choice seem real realistic Mm-hmm. Like, I'll give a yeah. good example, a good Trident episode example, um, and then you can finish your thoughts so that we have yes. some context for this. So there's an episode where Triton goes back into, like, his closet and he finds his old, um, or he gets it made, I can't remember which one. But anyway, he comes out with this instrument called a sea calliope, and it's basically an organ, okay? So it's big, it's loud, it's difficult, and um, he apparently played this sea calliope 
uh, instrument, uh, as did his dad. Like it's a family heirloom type of thing. So he's very excited for one of his daughters to uh, to take to the sea calliope. And he just he just out of the blue decides that's Ariel. This is Ariel's new hobby. She needs a new hobby. This is her new hobby. And assigns Sebastian to teach her the sea calliope. And um, it's very much like the parents telling their kids, like, no, you have to pick a sport. You can't just play video games all day. It's very much of that. But he yes. doesn't. what he does not understand is that Ariel's happy to play an instrument. She just doesn't want to be forced to play that ist- instrument because there's a side um, plot where she finds a human harp and she wants to learn to play the harp. And she's actually way better at the, the harp than she is at the sea calliope. Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much, Lunar. Thank you for the five months in a row. I love you so much. Um, so, so this is very, very relatable. I'm sure we have all known somebody or had the experience of a parent that said like, no, you cannot pick your own hobby. You need this hobby, you know? (laughs) Um, so, so yeah, that's basically what happens. And yeah, he gets angry at her and yeah, there's conflict, but it's this very understandable and relatable type of conflict. So there's like all these like little incidences that finally lead up to what happens in the movie where he gets so angry that he breaks her stuff the other thing is is that he never has to learn the lesson that he learned in the movie prior to this and that is a big important thing and in the tv show if i remember from synopsis is correct there are times where triton is right yeah there are there are times where ariel is straight up wrong and Ariel admits it. Yes. Uh, and, and sees it and learns that lesson. So we we are never like, Triton takes that role of a parent of being like, I do know the world and I am trying to protect you from it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and yes, I'm pushing my needs onto you. But at the same time, like, dude, I'm your parent. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and he, he never hits that same, like all of these are like little lessons that he can learn along the way sure he learned some things but for the most part he's never faced with the same exact lesson that he has to learn in the little mermaid prior to the events of the little mermaid Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yes that's going to be important here in a bit (laughs) yes so remember that put a pin in that for for a later conversation um but before we kind of end the tv show uh, I wanted to I wanted to get Landon's impression of some of what's considered the favorite episodes of this show, which is um, first a pair of episodes where we have Evil Manta as a villain voiced by the ineffable Tim Curry. And then um, Evil Manta comes... <laughs> right? And Evil Manta then comes back for the final episode of the whole thing where um, he has a son and he's trying to teach his son how to be evil. So, Landon, what was your impression of the Evil Manta episodes of this show? Classic. Classic <laughs> Dis- Disney TV villain. Uh, truly funny in ways that not meant to be funny, but also incredibly charismatic. And that might also be because of Tim, Cur- Tim Curry. Uh, perfect casting. Little Evil. <laughs> perfect casting. Uh, little Evil is the funniest thing to ever happen. Right. Uh, to just be like, hey, it's it's basically take your son to evil work day. <laughs> and it literally feels that way. And this little dude doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't know. No one else knows. And it's it is there is a lot of joy there. And they are there are some really funny jokes. There are some really funny moments. Um that again, I'm not a huge cartoon fan. I am not I, I this is hard for me, but there are times where I was like actually like fully watching, going like, oh, this is funny. This is great. <laughs> What's uh, so great about Little Evil is how he just wants to make art. He just yeah. wants to make sculptures. And sculptures aren't an evil enough hobby for for evil Manta. <laughs> it's it is so it is so it is so the soccer dad that's just like why do I have a theater kid? Uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and the the relatability that exists, um, and it just is really really fun. Uh, yeah. But as much as I loved Evil Manta, I I do have to say I think the Hans Christian Andersen episode ekes it out just a little bit that is a favorite Um, so a lot of people's memories of this show if they don't remember anything they will remember 
um, this episode. And it's called like Metal Fish or Brass Fish or something like that. Yeah. And uh, and it's about this explorer who goes down to the ocean in this fish-shaped submarine and he gets stuck. So what was – and everybody has to save him to get him back to the surface because he's going to drown, right? Because he's human. So what was your impression of this episode, Landon? It was really fun. It was just very – Kid, ooh, hold on. I mean, you're. I can still hear you. It like switched between microphones, so I just wanted to make sure I was on the right. Oh, mic. okay, okay. Um, uh, it was very like kid, <laughs> just kid friendly. But I do love like when it came out, and it was just like, oh, I'm Hans Christian Andersen, and just, <laughs> just like that moment of like, oh, that's that's clever. That's so clever for adults. It, it felt more like for an adult show, an adult like nod than it was necessarily a kid nod, but it was fun. It, yeah, it, it's really fun. Now, obviously, the real Hans Christian Andersen was not some deep sea explorer. No. He was, as we discussed in um, our previous episode on The Little Mermaid, an absolute disaster bisexual man Yes, um, who just wanted his friends so bad. And that's what was it's going on. <laughs> <laughs> no, and and the reason why Ariel was really like obsessed with him is because oh, answers to the human world, and it just was like a fun little like Easter yeah. egg connection of being like, oh, Hans Christian Andersen is the one that brought this story to life, so of course he would give Ariel the answers to the human world that she was craving. But at the same time, this is funny, and I think it's so. nice for kids to to for Disney to acknowledge explicitly like where their stories yeah. came from that like Disney did not come up with this the bones of it and a lot of the visuals even are in the original novel um, or short story that Hans Christian Andersen wrote so I do love the acknowledgement of that so that it's like you know they're not pretending that they made up the Little Mermaid because they didn't you know <laughs> no they they took the story and, and being able to admit that I think is really yeah. good yeah a really good start so Overall impressions of this cartoon for me, rewatching it as an adult, it was very nostalgic. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend most people watch every single episode like I did, um, unless you have kids. But I do think that if you have kids that are like mermaid obsessed, this would be a great one to just sign into Disney Plus and put on. I think I think a child could still watch a couple of episodes and it would hold up pretty well um, yes. because it's all like these little self-contained stories. And the morals are mostly like really good. There's nothing in this show that... Um, that like you look back and you're like, gosh, we were so problematic back then. Why did we think this was okay? No. You know, it's nothing like that. Like it's all like very nice and wholesome. And uh, most of the episodes surround themes of like, you know, it's okay to be yourself and individuality is good and um, diversity is awesome and let's all be creative. And it's like morals like that. So like uh, that Eat everyone's going to be happy not with. evil. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's morals like that that everyone's going to be happy with. So I think that this this cartoon really does stand up pretty well um and uh for the target audience that uh that it's at so that that was my overall impression Linda what was yours it's a fun cartoon I think that uh we owe a lot to this cartoon and how the the rest of the 90s plays out as far as animation and releases and creativity mm -hmm. uh, and not just the early 90s I think also into the aughts yeah. um really is dependent on the success of this cartoon and I am so glad that it succeeded because I think uh a lot of a lot of what was created in the early aughts would have been very different uh if it hadn't been I think so too. I think there's a pretty clear through line here when you go back and watch it. So yeah. All right. Next thing we would like to talk about is the sequel. So this was released in 2001 called Return to the Sea. You can see on our, our picture some of the stuff we're going to talk about here with this sequel. But I'm actually going to let Landon really take the reins at first for this one because this is your jam, right? Like this is this your is, movie. This is it. I love the original Little Mermaid and I love Return to the Sea. So basically what you need to know about it is... Uh, Morgana, who is Ursula's uh, sister, uh, makes an appearance at the birth announcement of uh, Ariel and Eric's daughter, Melody, and basically says, hey, I'm going to take revenge on you. And Ariel and Eric go, we can't have this happen. And as a result, they build this wall around the castle uh, that they live in and basically having to cut Ariel off from her roots and from her, her and from Atlantia and from her family in order to like 
protect their daughter, who then grows up obsessed and called to the sea, like so desperately wants to be there and be a part of it and is doing all the same things that her mother did. And so it, it like owes that sequel, that Disney traditional sequel, which is like you take the same storyline and you just twist it a little bit. And Melody meets you know, meets people and meets friends and gets stories about Atlantia and just her mom would never understand what it feels like to want to be a part of a community that they're that they can't be a part of and blah 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 and ends up meeting Morgana and Morgana promises her to be able to make her a, a mermaid and she wants to join Atlantis and does it and it's a whole bunch of shenanigans, the same kind of shenanigans that happen. Uh, to Ariel and Ariel must go out and save her daughter, uh, be able to be reunited to that part of her history and her roots uh, and explain to her daughter like where she came from and why her culture had been cut off for so long and why uh, Melody couldn't have access to it. And of course, in the end, they defeat Morgana and they're able to find a compromise where she can go down anytime she wants, but also live on land. And it's it's just kind of a beautiful compromise and just a, a fun retelling of the same story with familiar characters, but also new characters. Yeah, and they, they tear down the wall. Don't worry. They tear, oh, down, they the tear down the wall at the end. Yeah, absolutely tear down the wall. Yeah. So what's, what was very interesting about this movie to me that I thought was so funny um, is because, you know, Ariel in the original wants to become a human. But all of us little girls that were watching it just thought living under the sea looks so cool and we wanted to become mermaids. So that, so I feel like Disney was saying, we know what y'all want. We all want reverse Little Mermaid. Well, here you go. Here's reverse Little Mermaid. It's Melody. And I think everyone vibes with Melody when they watch this movie, at least for the first half. We'll get to the second half in a minute. But before we get to the second half, the first half of the movie, I just want to say, like, I was so into it. I was like, yes, of course Ursula would have a crazy sister. And it's so funny. She comes up, she's introduced, and Sebastian literally goes, oh my God, it's Ursula's crazy sister. It's like, yes, And you it buy is. it. You're just like, <laughs> yeah, it is. You're right. It's of so course. funny. It's so funny. And and she's great, by the way. Like, she's a great villain. She's not Ursula, but she's just Ursula enough that you're like, I vibe with this. But they didn't um, ever try to like make her Ursula, which is the thing yeah. I, I they I think that I think that I love about this and then also the Lion King sequel is they embraced the differences and highlighted the differences so well. They didn't yes. try to make the exact same characters. Yes, yes. And I think the other thing that I really vibed with at the beginning was that the Ariel character, Melody, was aged down. Okay. So instead of yeah. being like 15, 16, she's like 12, 13, which like makes a lot more sense. Like I understand these actions a lot better coming from a 12, 13 year old than a 15, 16 year old. You know what I mean? Um, and, uh, and the other thing that I was like really vibing with at first is I was like, yeah, even though Melody doesn't know that her mother's a mermaid and that she has relatives in, um, Atlantica, I thought that it was a really interesting message to say, like, you can't completely remove someone's roots from them. Like you can't hide the, their ancestry from them and expect them to just like move on. Like we all need to no. spend time understanding what our ancestors did did the good and the bad. And like, so I was so vibing with the first half of this movie because those were all the things I was getting out of it. I think like one of the most impactful scenes that I remember for a ver- from, from a very long time from my first time watching it is like, Ari- there's a scene where the wall is built. You can't see the ocean, but obviously like they're still on the beach. So there is an area of the ocean that is still coming up. It is very, very shallow. No fish can get in all of that kind of stuff. And Ariel, like, puts her feet in the water. And you can see, like, the cartoon version of her. You can see how much she misses being able to connect to her family and connect to her people. Even though she so much wanted to be human and doesn't regret it and loves it and knows that this is right for her. Like, there is that moment where she's just like, hi, dad. Like, she just wants to connect but can't in order to protect her daughter Mm -hmm. and i think so we not only see in melody of like this call to the sea but we also see an aerial of being like hey just because i chose something else doesn't mean this isn't still a part of me Mm -hmm. um 
And I think that that like is such such a an amazing take and metaphor on that as well. It is, and it's so real. I think for a lot of people that end up choosing a completely different lifestyle than what they grew up with, they still want to retain certain elements of their old lifestyle. Um, it's very hard to completely cut out what you lived with during your childhood and teenage years, even if you really, really want to, even if you know it's right for you, even if you know that you're going to be happier if you do it. Completely cutting it out is like almost impossible to do and still retain a, a solid sense of yourself. And you see that in Ariel in multiple ways. Like whenever Melody begins to find out that like Ariel has lied to her, because she finds out fairly early on, she doesn't know the details, but she finds out fairly early on that Ariel hasn't told her everything. And she's very upset about it. Ariel tries to go comfort her, but she can't bring it in herself to completely tell the truth. And you can just see how much pain Ariel is in with the fact that she doesn't feel like she can tell Melody the full truth. Yeah. And and I think like that's something really cool, a cool choice that they made is being able to see this different side of the character that we loved while also seeing the familiar actions in a new character. Yeah. Uh, really smart choices so much better than doing like oh eric's and ariel's first few years of marriage or whatever yeah. or or whatever like i'm thinking of the little the beauty and the beast sequels mm. that ended up happening that they this aren't that aren't a, good <laughs> that aren't good aren't good uh this is such the only oh hold on hold on just very quickly the christmas special for beauty and the beast is fantastic but okay okay while he is a beast anyway well yeah <laughs> uh, <laughs> little mermaid uh it, it is such a fun and beautiful con conceit and beginning and realistic and familiar enough, but also different enough to make it interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, as a kid and also as an adult, like the Little, Mer the Little Mermaid movie is, is an interesting, fun movie to watch as an adult. And I agree with this one too. Uh, I will say that the songs are not nearly as much of a banger. But no, the songs okay. are kind of crap. And not everything's good about this movie. We're going to get to that in a second. But before that's we do, I just want to say that I agree as far as like Disney, as Disney animated sequels go, this is one of the top ones that I've seen. Yeah. Now, I've not seen all of them. There's, there's several of them that I haven't even seen. But of the ones I've seen, this is one of the most enjoyable ones. Um, it's really good. Now, unfortunately, about halfway through, this movie completely lost me and I started seeing all of the flaws. And the reason that happened is these two X'd out doofuses on the screen that you can see. Their names are Tip and Dash, and they are terrible. They are awful. Okay, so let me take you on a journey. At this time, in 2001, Disney had a formula that they had worked and worked and worked and overworked, where part of the formula means that the main character has to have these funny animal or animal-like companions. Okay, sometimes the, the animal companions are actually pieces of furniture, sometimes they're gargoyles, whatever, but they're, they're animal companions, okay, non-human companions. So in this movie, we get Tip and Dash, and they are the most annoying fucking things that I have ever seen, okay? If you are somebody that hates the gargoyles in Hunchback of Notre Dame and think that movie would be better without the gargoyles, okay? You will have the same opinion of this movie because they are worse, okay? They are yeah. awful. They are so boring and they get so much screen time. I hate them. Landon, I'll let you talk before I go into detail about um, the scene in particular no. that makes me hate them so much. I 100% agree. Unfortunately, like, the the tragic disney sidekicks that come with it i think is an important part and like an, a consistent part of the renaissance of the disney renaissance um and and part of the algorithm that works so well uh but it really the problem is is that when you are then trying in a sequel you are not only trying to follow that algorithm but then you are playing against the original sidekicks and when you have a sidekick that is so good, so classically good as Sebastian, mm -hmm. probably one of the best Disney sidekicks and yeah, comedy and, relief and, and in with any Flounder, Disney movie. Like, they're just so good. It, you get, you can't live up to that. Mm -hmm. Like, you, you just can't. And it's, and what this was story wise, like just looking at a story wise is a you needed you needed some relief, you needed some uh, funny 
that children can relate to that weren't invested in the story. So you needed to have mm-hmm. some funny jokes and ridiculousness, v- thinking very much back to Little Mermaid and uh, Sebastian's uh, kitchen adventure. Like, we didn't like that either as part of the original movie because we felt like it was a waste of time. Um, but, but it's one scene. It, it's one but scene. It was one, it was one scene. Uh, but it's this is supposed to save the same purpose of that. Yeah. Uh, but they just failed completely. And it goes and on utterly. for so long. It goes on for so long. Um, I like this merely purely because a kid, I dreamed about being a mermaid and identify with Melody. Yes, that's why I was super into the first half because I was like, I can see this. Like, I'm here, I'm vibing, I get it. But then they intru- halfway through the movie, they introduce these two characters, right? And we find out, like, here, here is kind of their, their thing. They want to be heroes, but they're just bumbling idiots. And so they never save the day. They always make the day worse. And you think like, oh, that doesn't sound so bad, Karen. I mean, that's a little annoying for adults, but kids would like it. So you should you should um vibe with it. No. Here's why I don't vibe with it. Because when you pair that with everything that Melody is going through and what she tells us her wants and desires are, they completely clash. Here's what the movie does yeah. because they have to shoehorn these two idiots into the movie. Melody goes down into the ocean. She gets the magic from Morgana so that she can be a mermaid. She's only going to get to be a mermaid for a short amount of time before she turns back, blah, 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 blah. Okay, like you, you understand all of this is happening. Well, she talks a lot about how she doesn't belong in the human world and that becoming a mermaid makes her feel like she belongs. Now she's saying this before she's met a single other mermaid okay she's only met morgana so why does she feel that way she feels that way because she's a stupid kid and doesn't know but the movie could have given her more reasons to feel that way to to feel validated in those feelings and the movie even like hints that maybe at some point it was going to do that because melody and tip and dash all go to Atlantica because Morgana has told them, you need to steal the Triton Triton for me. And if you do that, I'll make the mermaid magic permanent. And Melody's like, fuck yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm say less. Bye. And, bye. <laughs> um, she, you know, it makes sense. Right. So like Melody gets to Atlantica and she runs into these three like fellow mermaid preteens. Okay. And Tip and Dash come in and drag her away from a connection that could have been valid, that could have made her like saying, I want to be a mermaid for us to believe that she's right, that she knows she wants to be kind of like we have to believe Ariel's right, that she would be better off as a human, that if she would have... If Tip and Dash had not been in the movie, and instead of insisting on having stupid animal sidekicks, Melody could have had this trio of mermaid friends, okay, then we could believe her feelings and have her feelings validated that, yes, she would be better off as a mermaid than a human, and she's right. But because of stupid Tip and Dash, we cannot feel that way the magic was dead for me when I saw Tip and Dash drag her away from that trio, and then the trio never shows up again. I was just like, part of me was just wondering, like, why didn't Sebastian go on this adventure with her? He was there. Why wasn't Sebastian? He was there. He was. He and I know that her. He, was, he was helping Ariel out a little bit. Like he was, he was there. But he shouldn't have the, been. The movie. He shouldn't have been. He should have been the. He should have been the one. Right. Yes. Like there, there's a through line there. There's the com- There's the comedy. Like also like he has a thing of like loving the ocean it's within his character to be like oh yeah the ocean is amazing and great and fantastic and all of those things uh rather than these two and it it is exactly at the moment tip and dash are introduced instead sebastian could have caught up to her ariel didn't have to be with sebastian ariel because ariel ends up hooking up with adult flounder like she could have just gone off with flounder for her part of the plot you know this didn't have to happen I also happen. understand. I also understand following the algorithm. Realistically, we were never going to get those trio of mermaids, right? But having a familiar, having a familiar sidekick, uh, or just having like the, the other thing too is that the thing that made Flounder and Sebastian so great is that they both weren't goofballs. Like this is they're both both Tip and Dash are the butt of the jokes. They they remind me very similarly yeah. to, uh, and I know it's very different because it was one scene versus the whole half of the movie. But uh, did you ever watch Brother Bear? Yes, I've seen Brother Bear. 
the 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 moose in brother bear mm-hmm, mm-hmm. they remind me of that but they're both the moose instead of it being one character yeah, you, oh yeah no because the moose there are two there i thought there were brother mooses oh maybe they're um, brother mooses it's been a really brother long time since i've seen that movie it's fine uh but they're just ridiculous and in the in the brother bear movie but um very around for five seconds five minutes max these guys are around for the whole half they're both ridiculous yeah and they're so annoying and honestly because of their inclusion and the their their actions kind of like taking me out of the movie and making me like not vibe with it anymore when we get to the ending where it's like everything is solved now because melody's found out the truth and we can't keep it from her anymore and we've killed morgana and like okay um well now we're gonna abolish the wall and now mer people and humans can live together happily ever after no more separation there's no there's no reason for that we're gonna totally throw out the whole thing about where like the humans are polluting the waters and that's why the conflict exists in the first place like it's just all it's all glossed over it's fine we're, we're friends now and because of because tip and dash had ruined pre- Previous moments in the movie for me the ending ended up feeling super cheesy in a way that it didn't have to i could have been on board with the cheese if they had just done melody's relationships with whatever they, whoever they were going to put her with differently but because they gave her tip and dash i was like this is stupid it's stupid i'm biased i have the nostalgia of loving it so it did not affect me as much well, but because as a kid, i understand tip and dash are only slightly annoying they're not incredibly annoying like they are to me yes Yes, absolutely. It is. It is the my nostalgia is blinding me. I realize that I am probably wrong here. Uh, it happens only once in a blue moon, and <laughs> this might be it. Uh, I think this movie is amazing. It's definitely and... good for a Disney sequel. I will say that. I still do think it yes. is. It's just that it just lost me halfway through, and I wish it hadn't because we just mentioned two ways that it could have done different and not lost me. So sure. You know. There were other options. <laughs> but we're also coming up from fans and not writers. And that's right, the other right. thing too. Otherwise, I will tell you, otherwise, this sequel feels like what it's kind of like reading a really good sequel fan fiction to something. Yeah. yeah. I will say that. Um, we got and I and I will I will admit that this is my second favorite sequel. Uh I think that Lion King The Lion tops King it is out. my favorite. Yeah. Uh but that's I think the reason why the Lion King tops it out is A. I'm in love with both of the lions. Well, we've got Kovu. And like, I mean, Kovu and 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 the and Simba's daughter, whose name I can't remember right now. And B, <laughs> the songs slap in that mm-hmm. movie. They and the songs are the songs are not movie. good in the this. The songs are not good in this one. Unfortunately, I like I like uh, Ariel's like little intro song, but that's also like the mo- like the for melody. But that's like the yeah. mom in me that's just like, let me show off my kid. Like that's yeah, just it's like not the, good. the internal mom. It's it's not uh, good. it is it is the feeling and not the song that yeah. are great. Yeah. Uh, but L- Lion King eats it out a little. Then we got Little Mermaid. Aladdin sequels follow somewhere in there. Yeah, too. I like the Aladdin sequels pretty good. Like they're not terrible, you know. You know. Um, but and then for I mean, I feel like Frozen is its own. It's its own beast. Yeah. Well, you know, I hate the original. So you know. Anyways, I don't like Frozen. I don't like Frozen. I don't think. I don't think it's good. You didn't know this. You know this. I'm a Frozen hater. I don't know why Elsa's so popular. Anna's a way better character. I've told you this. This is not new information. Sometimes Karen think, says things that are just, I think she just says them because she's actually a hipster. <laughs> she's just like, everybody else really loved it and I want to hate it. No, it's just because, it's just because I have certain standards and I know exactly what I'm looking for. Um, yeah. Is about Anna. You can sit there and say Anna is the better character. The movie is about Anna. It's not about Elsa. <laughs> anyways maybe we'll do a frozen episode someday so i can expound well, upon why frozen one. is third actually and not good fourth one coming out we have to do a frozen a- now okay. we have to maybe we'll do a frozen Ugh. episode <laughs> coming 2024 maybe probably yeah, not we'll we see. have 2024 planned so 2025 probably not but we'll see we'll see probably okay. not oh my god All right. it's gonna be my musical <laughs> I'm gonna make it my musical just to torture you I like Frozen, but I don't get why it's so overly popular. Yeah, I mean, that's probably the more charitable way to phrase my actual opinion, Arya. I'm saying it in, of course, a a very bombastic way because we're streaming right now. But yeah. Yeah. And it's (laughs) to piss me off. 
90 percent of what karen says <laughs> controversially is just to make me have a reaction <laughs> it's very funny it's very it's funny. i'm la- i'm glad that you enjoy my reactions <laughs> uh i will continue to overblow things because i enjoy doing it <laughs> all right you guys so that's that's the sequel that's the sequel um before we get to the next thing though we have a we have a very special piece of news um interstage window today is brought to you by something completely different what is it landon physical copy with me i just thought of that uh it's my book i wrote a book guys i've been hinting at it for months and it's here and it's now and i did the thing uh it is a poetry book uh it it will be my second i wrote one four years ago around Mm -hmm. the world and back again and now i have written one called the lessons i've paid for uh, and it is a very, very dear and special book to me. Uh, it is the collection of poetry that I have written throughout my thir- my 20s uh, as I approach my 30th birthday. Uh, and it is really taking a look at the amount of growth that I think a lot of people in their 20s go through uh, in the aspects of their lives such as uh, your mind and how you feel about yourself, the relationships that you're in, your relationship with your body, and also like your place in the world. And it's taking all of those things uh, and kind of having a through line of themes and and all the ways that I've grown and who I have become, but also hopefully in a relatable way that you guys can see a part of yourself in some of these stories. And I'm very, very proud of it. Uh, I am I am very excited. I am tired of working on it. So it uh so I'm very excited that it's coming out and it's it's basically done. Uh, I have one last thing that I have to edit and then I can hit submit and uh it comes out the 28th, the day before my birthday. All right. So 28th, you guys, 28th. Um, I am gonna make sure that on that day that y'all all have a link so that we can go get this book. The 28th is a Tuesday. So what that means is the link will be posted in Discord. Um, So we'll have a big announcement in there. And then for the stream uh, right after that, we will remind you guys about the book. Um, I know I'm gonna get my copy. So as soon as it drops and as soon as it gets here, I will show you guys. But I will also tell you there's some really nice like previews of some of the poems on Landon's TikTok. So um, Landon, Maine, just like everywhere else on TikTok, you can go find her and you can see some some videos of uh, just a few of the poems. Not all of them, right? Like only some of them are on TikTok, right? um, I have, so it'll be like 100, I have like 150 pages worth of poetry in here. So I think it's like near 80 poems. I, I think I only have like a handful uploaded to TikTok. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. uploading one every other day or so uh, to Instagram and TikTok. So you can find me at Land in Maine, same videos and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, it's I am really, really proud of this poetry um, and of what has been written. It's very exciting. <laughs> yes, we are so excited, and um, and I'm so so happy to to have an episode sponsored by uh, Landon's new book. So so yes, we will we'll let remind you guys after it drops yes. as well. Um, but yeah, that's your little preview that that's coming very 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 soon. Very soon, yes. It's I am very very excited about it. So yes, all right. Okay, so we have one more of the Little Mermaid extended use mm-hmm. movies to talk about. And that is the prequel called Ariel's Beginning. Let's not talk about 2008's Ariel's Beginning. I didn't read the slides in detail enough. I did not realize it said it until this moment when I'm reading it out loud to you guys. Well, you know what? We we are going to talk put, about it. We are. I was going to put a little speech bubble for this manta ray guy to say, like, uh, I hate this movie. Because yeah, uh, that's terrible. how we feel about it. It's Don't watch it. Don't Terrible. I will never get that 90 minutes of my life back. No. Never. I fast forward through a lot of it because it was stupid. Yeah. And I won't get that time back too. So uh, let okay, me but wait. Just, There's like yeah. a, like a couple of small good things about this sure. movie. So before we get into the rant, no, 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 let's no. talk about a couple of them. Yeah, no, okay. So first of all, gotta change your wording here. There are small there are a couple of mediocre things that compared to the rest not of it make things. it look good. A couple of not, not terrible, terrible things. things. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about what this movie is about. In order to kind of give you an insight into that. Uh, This is the story of Ariel's life pre The Little Mermaid. Um, Again, Ariel's beginnings. uh, Where we find out that her mother uh, was killed in a 
boat boating accident uh, upon trying to rescue this music box that she had had custom made because music was the way that her and th- that Ariel's mother Athena and King Triton uh, expressed love to one another. And as, <sighs> sorry, I'm trying to say it without breaking out in highs. Uh, and <laughs> as a way of uh, g- grieving, Triton decides that all music in the kingdom is banned that there is no music allowed very footloose of being Mm. like no dancing here no music here um and ariel and her sisters grow up very estranged from her father there there are very strict rules as to when they can see him how they're supposed to talk to him uh they they have a governess who is very resentful at being their governess as uh as someone who is in charge of them and Ariel is just like wants to connect with her father on a different way and her siblings don't understand why she needs this and she's just like but you don't understand let's like do a different walk and all this kind of stuff uh so much us else also happens Sebastian gets caught in a <laughs> there's a like underground crime ring aka music club uh that they get caught in uh performing because everybody else loves music even though king triton is still having this grieving thing and so no one so so the cops come in and break it up and the sisters get arrested for being there explicitly the royal advisor in this and yet he's he's running the underground music club that's illegal and it's like what (sighs) yeah yeah it's um you know and then triton learns the lesson that he shouldn't be so hard on the way that his daughter thinks and that perhaps she is right and and has some stance to stand on and that he's too tough on her and that uh how she is and and how what she wants can be different from him uh oh my god this is the same lesson that he learned in the little mermaid and you'd think that he'd learn this if he learned this lesson before you'd think that he'd take what he'd learn into the little mermaid oh, oh right it's a prequel so it's canon but it doesn't make any fucking sense and here's the deal like ariel is supposed this the events of this movie are supposed to take place like just a year or two before the actual movie she's still supposed to be a teenager in this this is not like 10 year old ariel okay this is teenage ariel okay just like in the the original little mermaid movie also doesn't have a personality like other than like i want my dad to love me differently (laughs) she doesn't okay only personality here the Oh, oh, okay. Good things before we go into bad things. Good yes, things okay, before okay. we go into bad so, things. Uh, some of the characters do have a personality, which is the sisters. So kind of like yes! in the cartoon, how the sisters get like a little bit more development. What's kind of cool about this movie is that most of the sisters get a little moment where you get a little insight into their individual personalities, which is cool, but unnecessary because we already got that from the 90s cartoon. Um, but we do get that here. And I did enjoy those little moments. They aren't terrible. You know, it's nice to give yeah. the, the the little the sisters you know a personality trait or two i like that you know i i really appreciate like especially the older sister like yeah. the eldest yeah uh, gets, and how she good. like i was like as an older sister just trying to beg your younger siblings to be like just do what you're supposed to do and he doesn't get angry i was like wow wow that's too real, real. <laughs> too real <laughs> too, i was like wow was that me is that is that what i did <laughs> Oh it's God! Like, why can't you just calm down? You're gonna oh. make them angry. <laughs> yeah, or like, oh, you're taking on the emotional baggage of your father because he can't do. It. Fuck. Uh, yeah. you're the old. That's the older sibling. Co- that's the <laughs> old eldest sibling complex right there. Oh, yeah. Okay. And then like, uh, so one of the sisters is like boy obsessed, and that yeah. like motivates a bunch of her actions in the movie. You know, so there's just like stuff like that. You, that's like it's get, good. Yes. Those are good moments. And and as and like we barely even got names for them in the first. We did get names for them, but barely got names for them in the first one. It was nice to see a different take on them and to see that yeah. dynamic. And that dynamic was really really fun. Yeah. Uh, I didn't realize because obviously I hadn't watched every single episode that the that those like personalities were very true to the original TV show. Um, which Karen informed me that they were, which is also yeah, really a lot cool. of them uh, are. And I think, a lot of them are are the same or either logical followings from. And I think that that praises the TV show more than it does this movie. Mm. Um, but also having 
specific archetypes represented in characters i think is really really good too yeah uh the other thing is, is athena's mom athena's athena's mom uh, ariel's mom athena is mm-hmm. uh very interesting compelling something that we don't get any answers to in the original now obviously in the remake we do get answers and explanations onto why triton is so protective and that was because humans killed her mother uh and this that is similar humans killed her mother however it was an accident um or or even of her own making where she chose to try to get the music box before she tried to save her own life uh because it was an important aspect of their love sort of thing uh and it was cool to be able to see a couple of scenes with them connecting Mm -hmm. with athena but also like learning about athena and uh and kind of seeing like that that character's personality and understanding that ariel is very similar to her mother uh and that was cool too Yeah, it's just that it's stupid that the conclusion Trident comes to from all of this is let's ban music for everyone forever. We're never going to ever have music again. Like, that's dumb. You know, um, like for that to be his reaction and for him to be become like that is is silly. Now, some of the other reactions where he becomes a more distant father, hires a governess, um, is very strict with them. Like that all follows through from what happens. But the actual like plot of banning music doesn't make any sense it's silly it's stupid yeah it banning music and then that also being the thing that they're rebelling against and yeah. not like the emotional neglect that they're feeling from their father or the distance or anything like that which is explicit in the movie uh, by the way like it's not just like yes. they're mad at him for banning music it is very clear as an adult watching that a lot of the sisters that don't really care about music what they're really upset with is the fact that they have this very rigid strict type of relationship with their father it's not real for them so my grand aspect too they're not nearly as affected or upset they've accepted it ariel yeah. is the only sister who hasn't accepted it yeah which is unrealistic but understandable for in terms of a movie yeah. um so the whole concept of banning music is so fucking stupid uh also sorry i'm cussing up a storm but it, this movie but it is so but it is really stupid um also the like concept of this music box <laughs> i feel like the writers watched anastasia <laughs> And was like, music boxes could be important. Let's throw a music box in here. Uh, because it like has the same concept of like this long forgotten uh, a lullaby that no one is in this connection to a, a parental figure that was lost because of trauma. And I was just like, we don't need a music box. And no one in Anastasia is trying to ban all music for forever. Because that's stupid. Yeah. No, because it was so stupid. So uh, this like concept of like this music box part of it all too was awful. I understand the metaphor of like Athena's death was not murder. It was caused by a tragic accident and her choice to go after this metaphor for her, her and Triton's love. But like. <sighs> yeah, it's just dumb. It's just dumb. Yeah. And okay, so there's one other there's one other thing that's actually good in the movie, and that is the governess's assistant who's named Benjamin. And the Benjamin's best. a manatee for some reason. I don't know why. I had to Google what animal he was because uh, you literally can't manatee. tell. Yeah, he's a green manatee. I've never seen a green manatee. So I'm I, not I had to I'm Google. Not up here. I was like, what I was I literally was like, what animal is Benjamin? Like into Google while I was watching the movie because I couldn't figure it out. He's a manatee. I don't want to rip it, it apart because this is an animated Disney movie. And part of what we loved about the uh, animated Disney movie was that it didn't have to look realistic. Yeah, yeah. But like I was Sebastian also like, doesn't look like a real crab, obviously. But like I was like, green? A green manatee? You couldn't have made him, I don't know, blue? Like, like I'm over here looking at our narwhal on this freaking slide going like, that's a more realistic manatee color than yeah. green <laughs> well and it's not it's not really that um it's not really that like he he's a fantasy color or something it's more about no. just like the way he's drawn you can't tell he's a manatee you can't tell he's that being said though however benjamin's fantastic he's the, the best, best character NPC. in this movie <laughs> the best npc i think in any disney movie yes i'm so ready good. to say that i will die on a hill for benjamin's passive aggressive uncaring bullshit yes of what is happening like i oh uh, imagine 
if in Emperor's New Groove, Kronk had an attitude. Imagine that. That's kind of like... Think... That's yeah. kind of like the type of relationship that the governess and Benjamin have, only instead of, like, where Kronk is, like, really dumb himbo, right? Benjamin is, like the sassy little boy i have i have a slightly better i have a slightly more like i i feel like imagine any gay any stereotypical gay hairstylist in the early 2000s yes oh my god he was so queer eye benjamin's so queer eye he's just like what <laughs> okay <laughs> like that's literally his life he is he is says one words at a time he's just like what do you want <laughs> he's so funny this, he's so queer eye and the, and i if, think if we had had as much benjamin as we had tip and dash in the other movie oh, this movie would be incredibly it'd improved. be better mm -hmm. i think that um like going off of villains that have because that is the other thing that was happening in this time too obviously 2008 is on the later scale of this but not only did princesses get sidekick animal sidekicks but villains did as well think iago yes. from aladdin all that kind of stuff uh, and we see it a little bit in, in the eels with Ursula, uh, but not really. They don't, they don't talk. Uh, so she just has them. Um, but, but I think Benjamin is the best villain sidekick animal for the fact that we just don't have the archetype of the uncaring, tired of your shit friend. He's so who's good. Who's just like, he's just like, yeah, you keep complaining about your job and I really don't relate to any of it benjamin literally hangs around because he finds the drama entertaining i swear i think she i think she pays him <laughs> i think to. she must she he's like always doing her hair and makeup and stuff like that and i'm just like oh he's hired to yeah. be there yeah because he's just like yeah you're right <laughs> it's so annoying he is such a paycheck he's such a paycheck yes so those those are the few things that are actually entertaining and amusing about this movie that being said it doesn't make it worth watching i promise it's not worth your time no, it's so not because worth your time. there are some fundamental things really super wrong with this movie um because triton ends up learning the exact same lesson that he learned in the original it leaves the movie feeling completely hollow and completely gutted where you can't even really go back and enjoy some of the things that are fun in this movie. This is the problem with prequels. Mm -hmm. Because if, especially if you have the same antagonist, as I said, my, I will write a whole thesis that Triton is the antagonist in the original movie. Uh, when you have the same antagonist, you cannot make that character more hateable in the prequel yeah it, it just can't happen um because he is a beloved character mm -hmm. so you can't make him worse than he was but you certainly can't make him better than he was so if you're he's gonna be in it he's gonna be the antagonist in this one he's gonna be the same exact thing person learning the exact same lesson and yeah. that will happen in any and every prequel the yep. uh, when you have the same characters the only prequels you can have are about completely different characters realistically mm -hmm. well they just should have picked a different conflict the conflict shouldn't have been between ariel and triton it should have been between like ariel and her sisters or something like who knows but, it, but something else but, I, but again like it just wouldn't like that wouldn't have worked because he is the only conflict that she has faced as far as we're concerned in any of it. So basically and this prequel shouldn't have been made. Yeah. They should I have made another sequel. Going to, I think, honestly, Karen, you ready for this? I think that if we're going to spend energy and time being angry at remakes, we need to spend more energy and time about being angry at prequels. <laughs> oh my God, yes. Okay, <laughs> so here's, here's the so other... Stupid. It's so stupid. And here's the other way that Triton is really messed up in this. So inside, in this movie, Triton gets this random, like, lawful streak about him. So in the original movie... Um, you know, when he finds that Ariel has this whole cave where she's collected a bunch of human stuff, he takes it upon himself to destroy a bunch of her things, right? He's not grounding her and sending her to her room. He's not bringing in the cops to like go through it and confiscate things. You know, he's not, he's not like sealing it off to say like, okay, it can exist, but you can't go in. Like he's not doing those things. But in this movie, when he gets mad and he finds out that this secret music club exists, he doesn't like... 
he doesn't do just the angry solo thing. He sends in the cops and arrests everyone. But that doesn't make any sense because that doesn't match any of the ways that he deals with his anger in either the um, original movie or in the cartoon prequel. So it's just a completely different type of of Triton. It's just a completely different character. He's not the same at all. No. Well, you want to talk about characters that are not the same. Oh, yes, I do. What's the other one? Imagine this. You're Ariel. You snuck out. You are in the sea, in the gardens, under the under curfew, knowing you're not supposed to be out. And you all of a sudden hear someone using seaweed pipes to play music. And you turn around the corner and there is your future best friend who's literally scared of his own shadow breaking the law in front of everybody. Oh my God. What do you do? The bravest little fish that could. Turns out Flounder, brave as could be in this movie. Flounder is literally like this like anarchist rebel in this movie that don't give no fucks about the rules he's gonna do what he wants he is more rebellious than ariel in a lot of ways it's just a completely different character but they're still calling him flounder like it's the same character it's not the same character it's not the same frustrating because god this this is the money grab like, that's the thing that makes me angry about that. For, like, at least at least the remake, sure, partially a money grab, different forum, different format, different thing, trying to hit a different generation, trying to be popular with a new generation to bring people in. This was like, oh, well, the first two were successful and so was the TV show, so we will make easy fucking money and not care about anything. Because we're going to throw Triton as a different character. We're going to give Ariel Ariel no personality other than wishing she had a different dad. And also the person, like, we're also just going to give Flounder. Like, there was, the writers had zero care about Mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a wonder that Sebastian still has the same personality for the most part. Like, it's amazing that they didn't drastically change him. And even he, like, is barely, like, the soul, barely has the soul of his own character in the movie either. And realistically, if you take it apart, like, this is the man that, like, um, was trying so hard to, uh, like, give Triton everything he wanted. And he's mm-hmm. the one running an underclub, an underclub illegal singing music ring. It doesn't make sense. He's actively sense. breaking the law. It doesn't make I sense. I mean, we know Sebastian loves music enough that he would do something like that. But considering how important his job is to him, it doesn't make sense that he's as involved as he is. Yep. So anyways, this movie was terrible. Um, I'm trying to think, like, maybe... <sighs> Maybe the Mulan sequel is worse. I have seen that one. It's really no, bad. it's good. It's but, it's not bad. Not well, it's the not worse than one. that. Yeah, or maybe oh, one not quite. The um, third maybe, one is maybe the yeah the third one is what I'm saying. Maybe the that's thir- the problem. Yeah, the third is, one is the third ones of a lot of these movies are really awful. I'm just trying to make money at that point. Yeah. Like I think the only one that has had success beyond two is Toy Story, and that's because I also feel like Toy Story is keeping a soul. Yeah, but also, like, like, if you watch the Toy Story movies back to back, the quality does degrade. The third one's not as good as the other two. Yeah. But it's nothing. It's nothing on this level of bad. It's nothing on this level. No. Um, But also, I mean, there is something to say, too, about this, though, is that this movie was 20 years later. Yeah. Like, there, like no one was the same. Yeah, so no one cared anymore about keeping any, any but I in. Like, it doesn't matter. I also feel like it was corporate. I mean, I, I also feel like that that's this time, though. Yeah. I mean, 2008 is when it started turning, when Disney started becoming more corporate and more about making money. I mean, it was always about making money. Yeah, but, but you know, really... but, but Disney does have, like, periods where they where they money and, like, they value art a little money more. Money and they, art, yeah. Yeah, they kind of, like, do this, like, back and forth. The stories that were being told, it was the pre... I mean, I think this was pre-Pixar, Disney... Combo. I think that they were fo- both central entities in 2008. My timeline. I'm trying to remember. Wrong. I was in. I was um, graduating college around this time. I don't really remember when Pixar came into the picture, but I can Google it real quick. Yeah, but I think that overall, like, we're we're really starting to see Disney favor money 
because all of from like here on out all of the movies that it creates without the backing of pixar uh is soulless yeah disney had just acquired pixar around this time they acquired pixar in january of 2006 okay so yeah it was it it was probably trying to make money off of the of buying the deal or whatever like Mm -hmm. pixar pixar owned the soul of disney at that point like had all of the art all of the creation all of the soul went into it and everything else that was not pixar was trying to to earn to the bottom line and yeah. what's easier than than something that is insanely popular and the sequel did so well let's do a prequel yep yeah so anyway this movie's terrible i think I said everything i wanted to say about it <laughs> is bad what it's other bad, bad disney sequels would you like us to watch guys let us know in the comments down below <laughs> I'm along would be fun yeah uh, hey we got beauty and the beast maybe we just have a disney sequel day we we rank the sequels yeah well i mean we we did rank all of the we did all the remake ranking i don't know anyways this movie was bad i'm sad i i'm sad i wasted my time on it but i'm so glad i was able to share some of that with you me too uh you know what's a good sequel what's a good frozen Yeah, well, I have never seen it because I didn't like the original. So that is yet to be determined for me. (laughs) All right. Shall we tell them where we are next week? Yes. Okay, you guys. So um, after this, uh, after we end here, we're going to take a little bit of a break on stream and then we're going to stream some more classic hardcore. Y'all, I'm still alive. So that's a big thing that we're doing on the on the Twitch channel right now. We're also doing our new game plus of um, Final Fantasy X-2. So those, that's my main Sunday game. Um, so yeah, you can find me here on Twitch. I also now stream on YouTube too. So if you prefer to catch the streams there, you can. I don't really watch the YouTube chat though. And also you can see Twitter is missing. Twitter is missing because I'm on Blue Sky now. That's where I'm doing. That's where I am. So here's all my socials. Also, you guys should definitely join the Discord because hint, hint, there's going to be a very special Discord-only event happening after Thanksgiving. So um, so yeah, get in the Discord if you want to be there for that. So that's all the things for me, Landon. Where can everybody find you? You can find me at Land in Maine on TikTok and Instagram. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter, technically, or Bird or Tweet or whatever it's called, X, whatever. No, we don't uh, have Twitter in this house. We do not respect it. We call it Twitter, not X. I will not It took that It nonsense. took me four names to get to X. So, like, at least I <laughs> didn't try it first. Uh, you can go ahead and please, please, please look out for any announcements in the Discord or anywhere else that I might post for my book because I am so, so very excited uh, to share my journey with you all and for you to read my poetry and then tear it to pieces because that's what I do on here is I tear art to pieces and then now I'm expecting you guys to do it to me so Landon oh my god what if some of our friends (laughs) made TikToks about your poems wouldn't that be so fun no that'd be terrifying (laughs) I'd hate that I (laughs) I mean do it but also don't you can do it i think good and good and bad but sprinkle some good in there maybe too i know some of them are really good because of the tiktok previews that we have so thank you um all right that's where you can find me uh and then obviously not next week but the week after that we will be back for um we have a certain movie we're watching Okay, so yeah, week after next Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes movie, we're going to go see the movie and we're going to tell you all of our thoughts. So yes. get ready for that. I'm very excited. I'm very excited. All right. It'll be a lot of fun. Yes. All right, you guys. So, okay, so that's going to end the stream for today. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the YouTube recording for y'all watching um, on the recording. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe down below. And of course, as always, don't forget to make it a great day. And don't forget to be awesome. All right. Bye, y'all. Thank <laughs> you.